Welcome to Stagecoach, where you'll find the best Western books on the market and the men and women who write them. This podcast is brought to you by Dusty Saddle Publishing, home of the best-selling authors in the Western genre. This is your host, Ginger Winters. Join us as we continue the story of Finn Sullivan, Mountain Man, by Scotty Casper, read by Jerry Underhill. Chapter 4. Escape Finn had been at sea two long years, and he had become pretty much a full-grown man. He stood six foot two inches, and he weighed 195 pounds. He had reached his full height, but he would put on a few more pounds of muscle as he matured. Cash had worked diligently with him and had taught him how to use his fists. The petty officer that warned the ruffian Rory to stay away from Finn was no longer sailing with the Tam O'Shanter, so Rory walked up and sucker punched Finn flush in the face. Finn went down and struggled with all his might to stay conscious. In the meantime, Cash held Rory back and prevented him from stomping Finn to death. Yep, son. Take this miserable cur apart, Cash told Finn once his head had cleared. Use your newfound skills and tear this meat house down. Finn struggled to his feet and shook his head to further clear the cobwebs. Rory outweighed him by 40 pounds, but it didn't matter. Rory swept in and reined in punch after punch, but Finn was able to slip all of the punches, except one that slid along the side of his head and damaged his ear. I'm about to teach you a lesson, Finn said, and when it's all over, I want you to stay strictly away from me because if you ever come at me again, I'll kill you. Most of the sailors on the Tam O'Shanter gathered round to watch the fight, and surprisingly enough, most of them cheered for Finn. Rory was a boisterous, vulgar brute, and he was widely disliked. Rory danced around and fainted several times before he threw a left jab. It was a perfect setup for Finn. Cash had told him what to do when a man throws a left jab. He threw his head to the left and slipped the punch and then he slid his fist along the rail, the rail being Rory's left arm. His straight end right caught Rory flush in the face and broke his nose, and blood spilled forth as he went down in a heap. How'd that feel, Rory? Finn asked. Rory didn't answer. He shook his head a few times and climbed back onto his feet. If nothing else, the fellow was tough. He roared with rage and rushed at Finn, hoping to smash him to bits with his bulk. Finn stepped aside at the last second and caught Rory by one of his massive arms and slung him headlong into a bulkhead. That took the starch out of the fellow, and he collapsed onto the deck in a semi-conscious state. Hey, hey, what's going on here? One of the ship's officers said when he happened on the scene. Break it up, break it up. We can't have this sort of thing on this ship. Sir, Cash said. Please let them settle this once and for all. Rory has been bullying Finn for over a year now. Carry on, the man said. The time spent dealing with the officer gave Rory enough time to clear his head, so he rushed in and threw a flurry of punches at Finn's head. Finn acquitted himself beautifully and fended off all of the blows, and he flicked in pinpoint jabs to Rory's face and hooked him to the body time and time again, and one of his blows caught Rory right over his liver and hurt him terribly. Such a blow takes a man's legs away, and he just sort of goes into a paralysis. Rory lowered his arms to protect his body, and Finn took the opportunity to go headhunting. He threw in a combination of shots that rocked Rory's head left, right, and straight back. Rory wilted to the deck unconscious. He lay there bleeding freely from his wrecked face, and Finn had no sympathy for him. In fact, he hoped the loudmouthed wretch would die. All right, the officer said. Carry on, gentlemen. The ship's officer threw a bucket of water on Rory's face to revive him, and then he gave him a stern warning. I want you to stay strictly away from Finn. If you disobey and happen to kill this young fella, I'll hang you from the yardum. But if you just get caught fighting again with little harm done to Finn, 
I put you on bread and water for a month and have you caned. Am I understood? Yes, sir. Cash patted Finn on the shoulder. You did a wonderful job. You thoroughly learned the boxing skills I taught you. But as you get a little more mature, you'll be able to just put a little more thunder into your punches and settle these matters more quickly. But I'll say this. I've never seen a faster pair of hands. Never. Thank you. I got a confession to make. Once I got myself in the middle of that fight, I found myself really enjoying it. I guess I just like the taste of blood. That's all right, Finn. But never start a fight. In other words, don't be a bully. But when the other man starts it, I want you to finish it. Yes, of course. I have no intention of being a bully. Finn, let's change the subject. They found themselves alone on the deck, so it was easy to keep their conversation private. As you know, we picked up a load of wares from Port Emmingham in England. Yes, so? Did you know we are loaded with textiles, cutlery, wine, millstone, and coal? Yes, I know that. I don't know where we're taking these goods. We are headed to California, the west coast of America. I've never been to California, but I've heard it's a beautiful place with nice weather. Cash, you must have a reason for telling me this. I do. We're going to sail into the Golden Gate port to unload our cargo. San Francisco was settled in 1769. One of the ship's officers told me the colonists from Spain established the Presidio of San Francisco there. Cash, you must have a reason for telling me all this, Finn repeated. I think when we sail into that port, we should try to make our escape. Everybody will be busy unloading the ship. We should be able to slip away. I think we must try it, even if we get caught and killed. Let's do it. I don't know how much more of being a captive I can stand. Cash smiled. Escaping from there in California would be perfect. It would be much easier to get to Montana from there. If we escaped in Boston or New York, we'd have to travel 3,000 miles to reach Montana. San Francisco would only be a 1,000. I agree with you, Cash. I do. Let's get off this ship or die trying. Once they sailed within 500 miles of the California coast, the boatswain, a fellow named Seamus O'Connor, took ill. Captain Walsh recognized the old salt's illness as Ricketts. Every time we pulled into a port, we brought on board a cargo of citrus fruits. You were instructed to eat all the citrus you could choke down to avoid rickets. Did you? The captain asked. No, I hate citrus, Seamus said. Well, I have a problem having any sympathy for you. You know where this is leading, don't you? Yes, I'm going to die. Finn felt sorry for the old salt because the old fella had always treated him with respect. The man had been at sea for thirty years, so he had to have known about the danger of rickets and to eat citrus fruits when they were available. Cash, I think the old fella's committing suicide in a very unusual manner. What do you think? Yeah, what you say makes sense. Finn and Cash watched the man slowly deteriorate. His bones got sore and painful. He tired quickly, and he developed bow legs that made it hard for him to walk. So he had to waddle. His ankles, wrists, and knees thickened, and his skull deformed. It was hard to watch the old fella falling apart. His teeth deformed and holes developed in the enamel. It was a cruel disease, and it seemed like it took forever for him to die and finally find relief. But one morning they found him dead in his hammock. Later in the day they placed him in a bag, read a few words over him from a Bible, and slid him into the sea. Finn was saddened by it, and he would have cried for the fella if he could have done it in private. Later in the afternoon, after everybody finished their chores, the quartermaster broke out the rum and everybody got roaring drunk, except for Finn. He never drank the stuff. 
Cash had one cup of the fiery liquid and then quit drinking. The rest of the ship's crew got knee-crawling drunk and didn't seem to be bothered in the least by Seamus O'Connor's death. In fact, it seemed as if they used the passing as an excuse to have a drunken soiree. The Tam O'Shanter sailed another two weeks and experienced bad weather over a two-day period. The wind and rain kicked up, stopping just short of being a full-blown hurricane. Everybody aboard the ship acquitted themselves professionally during the bad weather and survived the storm and came out on the other side of it intact, and there was minimal damage to the ship. At long last, the ship sailed into the port in San Francisco. Finn was delighted. He'd always wanted to visit America. But his first impression was less than satisfactory. But he knew the visit would get better, despite that the ship docked and dropped the anchor in Flotsam, with dead fish, a dead dog, and a sort of scum floating on top of the water. And the odor was simply terrible. Everybody on the ship was assigned a task, and they all went to work unloading the cargo. Cash and Finn were tasked with unloading pallets loaded with textiles. At the time, it seemed kind of fitting that Finn was working with textiles, considering he was part owner and a textile manufacturer in Dublin, Ireland. Finn and Cash unloaded the textiles in record time, and then looked around for some way to slip off of the ship unseen and escape. It was obvious that the other crews were going to stay busy with the unloading for a couple of more hours, so they knew they had plenty of time to make their escape. The ship's captain, Brady Walsh, didn't help with offloading the cargo. Such work was below his station in life. Let's pay the captain a visit, and then get off this tub, Cash said. They slipped into Walsh's quarters and locked the door behind them. Hey there, you swine. What's the meaning of this invasion? Back to work, Walsh said. Well, Captain, it's a day of reckoning for you, Cash said. You mean to kill me? He asked. No, but when Finn here gets done with you, you'll wish you were dead. We were brought onto this ship against our will. Worked to the point of exhaustion every day. We were fed slop, and we were cussed, whipped, and abused, and treated with disdain. What do you intend on doing? Help! Help! He screamed. Nobody can hear you. You might as well save your breath. What do you intend on doing? He repeated. I'll have you flogged for this. Shut up. No, he won't, Cash said. I'll open that safe for there. I want to collect wages for three years of extensive labor. And Finn here will want to be paid for the two years he spent on this vessel. Let's say we earn thirty dollars a month, so Finn has seven twenty coming and I got nine hundred. It's a good thing you're paying in dollars, because we are jumping ship in America. So you intend on robbing me? No, we'll only take the amount we have coming. You'll never get away with this. I'll see it to it that you are both hanged from the yardum. Cash and Finn collected the money from the safe, the amount they figured they had earned, and then locked the safe. All right, now, Finn. Take this son of a bitch apart with your fists. Use everything I taught you about boxing. Finn lit into Captain Walsh like a whirling dervish and gave him a beating that would take a month to recover from. He felt righteous about it, justified. And when his fist smashed into Walsh's face, he felt satisfaction. In the end, Cash had to pull him off to keep him from killing Walsh. Even though the evil son of a bitch deserves to be killed, I think it is even better this way. Think of the suffering he'll go through, Cash said. Captain Walsh laid in the corner, and his bleeding face was beaten into junk, and his body was severely bruised. He was whimpering like a little child, and more than likely he had broken ribs. Cash and Finn tied him up, put a gag in his mouth, and slipped out of his living quarters and locked his door. Finn and Cash each shouldered a 132-pound jute bag of coffee. Shouldering that much weight wasn't a problem for Finn, but Cash staggered under the weight 
He was definitely feeling his advanced age. Both men staggered along, tried to rid themselves of their sea legs. They were used to compensating for being rocked back and forth by wave action. Cash, why don't you drop that bag and just sort of follow around behind? Just act like you know what you're doing. Oh, I'll manage. We need to make this look like we are helping with the offloading. The Tam O'Shanter sailors had built a mound of coffee beans on the dock that stood ten feet tall. The San Francisco merchants that had purchased the coffee hadn't pulled up yet with their wagons to haul the precious commodity to their warehouses. Finn and Cash stood there for a few minutes in order to let their muscles recover from the exertion and to let their breathing slow down. Once they were rested, they looked around. Nobody was watching, so they took that opportunity to slip onto the far side of the mound of coffee. And they couldn't believe their good luck. There was a street back there that went slightly downhill and disappeared into the San Francisco Presidio. That would be entirely out of the sight of the Tam O'Shanter. That Presidio is a fortress full of Mexicans and Spanish. I don't think we should go in there. It might be dangerous for us. But when we get down there closer, let's skirt around it and head east. Maybe we can find a rancho and buy supplies and horses. Ash, what you say makes sense, but... But what are we going to eat in the meantime? I don't know. We'll figure out something. A man can go a long time without food, Finn. Water is a different matter. We will have to find water. Finn and Cash thought they would have a better chance of finding someone to sell them horses by traveling east for a ways. And that turned out being true. They approached a man-made wall that stretched for miles, going each direction, and decided to spend the night there. They spent a miserable night because they didn't have a sleeping robe or blankets. The following morning, a gaily dressed vaquero rode up to them. What are you doing here? he asked. Why, you own this land? Cash asked. Yes, I own 440 acres here. I have a Spanish land grant. My rancho is about a mile from here. We're just passing through, Cash said. You don't have equipment? Horses, food? Why is that? Cash smiled, trying to placate the man. It's a long story. But we don't intend on staying on your land for long. We're just passing through. You needn't worry about us. We'll do you no harm. I hope not, because my men would hunt you down. Who are you? Cash asked. My name is Juan Hernandez. I am the owner of the San Vicente Rancho. We have vast herds of horses and cattle. I employ harness makers, house servants, carpenters, tanners, men that make tallow and large iron pots, and wranglers. What are the chances of you selling us three of those horses? Do you have money? Yes. I have vast herds of horses. I will take you to my rancho. Feed you dinner and breakfast, and outfit you for your journey. Where are you going? Montana. It gets cold up there, but all right. If you have enough money, I think I can provide you with all you need. Juan was dressed in pantaloons that went only to his knees. The pantaloons had silver lace at the bottom, and he was wearing beautifully embroidered leggings. He wore a bright woolen vest with lots of pockets, and his shirt was frilly. His ensemble was topped off with a bright blue jacket tied with a red sash at the waist. It was obvious he had a successful rancho. Juan, before we go to your rancho, will you tell us about this wall? The wall was stacked stones with no mortar. It stood eight feet tall in places, and it was covered in lichen. It was obvious that it was very old. Yes, of course. Most people are curious about it. We call it the Mystery Wall. It is an ancient thing. Nobody knows who built it, or when they built it, or why. Did you know it is fifty miles long? Some say there was an advanced civilization here, centuries ago before the Spanish, the Mexican, or the Californios moved in here. And the ancients built it. Some even think it was the Mongols who built it. It truly is a mystery because no one can figure out what purpose it served. It's not tall enough to keep enemies away. 
It's not good for keeping livestock hemmed in. And it's not a levy. So why was it built? There are even those who think the Chinese built it. You are aware they built a Great Wall 5,000 miles long in China, and it took them 2,000 years? Finn and Cash just looked at him. Juan said, I'm riding back to the rancho now. Just follow this trail you are standing on, and it will take you right to the rancho. It is a little adobe building with a full-length portico. There are outbuildings, corrals, and gardens all over the place. Just look for a place with hundreds of horses and cattle grazing in nearby pastures. Thank you, Cash said. When you get there, we will conduct our business, and then we will eat supper. I will put you up for the night in an upstairs bedroom, and after breakfast in the morning, you can be on your way. Cash and Finn marveled at the rancho. It was truly magnificent. It's a shame we weren't around to get one of these Spanish land grants, Cash said. Then we could be living a life of luxury, this Juan fella. Juan met them on the portico and invited them into his home. They stepped into the largest living room they had ever seen. It was furnished with some hand-carved lovely furniture, with parlor chairs done up in red crushed velvet, a leather couch, trophy heads mounted to the walls, oak shelving lined with knickknacks, and several Chippendale mahogany tilt-top tea tables. And there was a huge bookshelf lined with great numbers of classic books that looked like they'd never been read. Everything in the room hinted at money. Lots of money. But it seemed like they had mixed too many styles together. It seemed to Finn that they should have decorated strictly in Mexican or Spanish style. But, all in all, It was still a nice room. Gentlemen, let's go in my office and conduct our business, and then we will dine, Juan said. The office was all done up in leather and oak. I can outfit you with two fifty caliber Hawken rifles, two brass-barreled flintlock horse pistols and fifty-three caliber, three horses, two sleeping robes, warm clothing, two heavy coats, rain parkas, two knives, Powder, lead, pots, pans, eating utensils, and canteens. Can you think of anything else you will need? About food. I can set you up with a week's supply of food. Hats? Yes, hats. Smoking tobacco. Yes, I have that. Gloves? Yes, gloves. All right, that should be all we need. How much money do you want for it all? We only have American money. American is fine. Oh, I just thought of something else that would be essential. You'll need saddles, bridles, and saddle blankets. Yes, of course, Cash said. How much? How does $300 sound? Got yourself a deal, Cash said. The dinner was sumptuous. They hadn't had such fine food for years. They had roast beef, brown gravy, corn on the cob, peas, biscuits, and strong hot coffee. Juan brought out cigars and champagne after dinner. Finn chose more coffee instead. Juan's wife was a beauty with raven black hair that hung part way down her back. And they had a daughter that was simply beautiful as well. She looked just like her mother. Both ladies had Spanish blood with sparkling brown eyes. Finn had trouble taking his eyes off of the daughter. The next morning they had a nice breakfast, and Juan took them out to the pasture and let them choose their horses. Finn chose a beautiful Palomino gelding, and Cash chose a chestnut stallion. Both horses were magnificent creatures, and they were thoroughbreds. It didn't take them long to load the pack horse and take off toward Montana, with their spirits high. You ever ridden a horse before? Cash asked. Some, Finn answered. Dear God. All right. Let me give you a short lesson before we start. Then from here you'll just have to pick up the skill as we go. Don't worry, though. You'll learn. Chapter 5 Surprise attack. Finn and Cash started out riding due south, 
They had to skirt around the San Francisco Bay before they could head northeast toward Montana. They were headed to a spot just north of Kalispell, Montana, near the present-day Glacier National Park, a place of incomparable beauty. As mentioned earlier, they had a thousand-mile ride ahead of them. They started off the morning with excitement. Finn's Palomino started in with bucking and trying to dislodge Finn, but Finn grabbed onto the saddle horn and held on for dear life. He did a remarkable job clinging to the saddle horn and staying glued to the hurricane deck. Finally, the spirited animal took off running full speed, then threw on the brakes, and Finn sailed over his head and landed on his face in the gravel, digging a little trench with his face. When Cash came charging up to see how badly he was injured, Finn managed to croak, Don't move me. If that fool horse has broken your neck, I'm going to shoot him dead. Finn, what hurts the most? My neck. When I hit the ground, I kinked it really badly. I'm afraid I have a broken neck. Finn, let me carefully roll you over so I can see what damage has been done. All right, Cash, but do it gently. My neck really hurts. Cash gently rolled him over onto his back. His face looked like somebody had taken sandpaper to it. There is no way to describe the reason. Cash couldn't even explain it. But he laughed a little bit at the sight of Finn's abraded face. Damn it, Cash, what are you laughing at? Here I am, half killed, and you think it's funny? I'm sorry, Finn, it's your face. The state of it tickles my funny bone for some reason. Be damned, if I wasn't hurting so bad, I'd get up and kick your old ass. After saying that, he started laughing himself. Suppose I am a sight. Cash managed to stop laughing. Finn, see if you can move your legs. Finn moved both legs. Move your arms, Cash said. Finn moved his arms without any problem. Thank the Lord, I don't think you're paralyzed. Do you think you can stand up now? Finn got back on his feet. I feel a little wobbly, but I think I'm going to be all right. I think you just have a badly sprained neck, but it will get better after a few days and your face will heal. After saying that, he almost lost control again and started laughing. But he was able to rein it in. I can see you nearly busting a gut laughing again. Damn it, Cash. Sorry. Cash, I'm going to fetch that 50 caliber Hawkin and shoot that son of a bitch in Palomino. No, no, you can't do that. You need him to carry you to Montana. Tell you what, why don't I ride the Palomino for a couple days, gentle him down a little, then we can trade back again. All right, that makes sense, Finn said. Let's go. Daylight's burning. They mounted and took to the trail. Cash? Yes. The next time you get all bungled up, I'm going to laugh my ass off at you. Cash chuckled. Fair enough, he said. The buckskin was better behaved, but riding him the rest of the afternoon was still agonizing for Finn. He had bruises all over his body from getting chucked over the Palomino's head, but his neck hurt the worst. It throbbed. Finn and Cash rode into the San Joaquin Valley, and they rode up to a family of digger Indians. The Indians looked like beggars. They were filthy dirty, and their clothing was in rags. I've never seen an Indian before. Do you know what tribe these wretches belong to? Finn asked. They are digger Indians, the poorest of the poor. It's just a derogatory name given them by the whites because they dig roots to eat, scrounge fruit from many unusual sources. Diggers represent many different tribes. You got you, Paiute, Yaku, Nisman, Meltu, name a few. These poor beggars are looked down upon by the whites. Sort of isn't fair. They're just doing their best to scratch out a living. There were four digger Indians, and they were standing outside of their home, a dugout in the side of a hill with a buffalo hide for a door. It looked like a married couple and two children. How thin they are. Poor beggars. Maybe we should give them food, Cash. I don't know about that. What if we run out before we find another mercantile? We've got guns. Can't we shoot a deer or a buffalo? Yes. <clears throat> you are right. We should give them food. But when the food runs out, they'll go back to their old ways and dig for roots. 
Cash, we can't help that. At least they will eat good for a while. Cash got into their packs and dug out a slab of bacon, several potatoes, jerky hardtack, and a big chunk of salted beef. The Indians were delighted. Cash and Finn had trouble communicating with them. They spoke a language that was incomprehensible. But the father managed to ask if Finn and Cash would have supper with them. Cash told them no, but he was nice about it so as to not hurt the man's feelings. Can you imagine how nasty their cooking utensils, cups, and place must be? I'd hate eating with them, Cash said. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. But don't you feel good about helping them out? Yes, helping others is always satisfying. The San Joaquin Valley was a huge expanse of meadowland. Finn and Cash pulled their horses to a stop, dismounted, and looked across the vista. I've never seen such a beautiful sight, Finn said. Yes, it is. If a man had a hankering for farming, this would be the place to do it. Cash reached down and scooped up a handful of earth. Look at this dark, rich soil. A man could grow almost anything here. Cotton, fruit, vegetables, grapes, hay, nuts, watermelon, sugar beets. How do you know such things? Finn asked. Comes from living in various places for nearly six decades, Finn. Don't worry. You'll learn such things as you mature. What do you say? Let's ride. Montana, here we come. We are free, free at last. The sailors of the Tam O'Shanter finished unloading at the dock of the San Francisco Bay, and they looked around for Captain Walsh. He generally stepped off the ship to sign papers with the merchants receiving the goods and attend to other chores. Rory found Walsh beat all to hell. What happened? He asked. That younger named Finn and his sidekick Cash came in here and beat the hell out of me and robbed me of $800. I knew those two couldn't be trusted. Rory, I want you to pick a good man to accompany you and go after them, Walsh said through swollen lips. I want them dead. I'd like to do that, but will the Tambo Shanters will help me? No, I'll wait here for you for two weeks. That ought to give you plenty of time to run them down, because they are afoot. That means they'll sail without me in two weeks, Rory asked. If you haven't found them and settled the account with them, let it go and come back in two weeks. We'll sail out of here, half for China, with a cargo of gold, silver, and cotton. I'll need money to rent a couple of horses and for supplies. Turn your back and I'll open the safe and fetch you some. Here's three hundred dollars. Give me enough money for rent of horses and supplies and what is left over can go in your pockets. Thanks, Cap Wolf, Rory said. It will be a pleasure killing those two bastards. Good luck on the hunt. Take Braden McCarthy with you. I heard he traped through the American West at one time. Now he's an excellent tracker. Will do, boss. Rory, would you send Liam Kellerman here? He's a pretty good doctor, and I need someone to patch me up after the beating I took. It was that yonker Finn that beat me to a farewell lee, and Cash just watched. Watch out for that boy. He's got mighty handy with his dukes. Don't give him a chance to use him on you. Finn and Cash rode north for two more hours. Cash, can we set up an early camp? I ache all over from that tumble I took. They found a nice spot with a little artesian well that bubbled out of the ground, and there was plenty of grass for their horses and dry firewood for a campfire. Now nah, I'm going to teach you how to set up a camp, Cash said. If you want to become a mountain man, you'll need to know how to do that. Do you think you can take the packs off the pack horse and unsaddle our riding horses? Or you hurt too badly? I can manage it, Cash. I'm not a baby. But I did have to get off that horse. I was being jarred with every step he took. My ass been rubbed raw. Cash laughed. Your ass will toughen up as we go. And mine's hurting too. As soon as you unload the horses, call me and I'll show you how to lead them to water. And then hobble them on over for a good patch of grass. The man should always attend to his horse first. If you neglect your horse and he dies or comes up lame... You were afoot and in trouble. While Finn worked at taking care of the horses, Cash built a nice little fire. 
He made a circle with rocks, laid in dried grass and twigs, and then used a flint and striker to make a spark to ignite the fire. When the fire caught, he fed it bigger and bigger twigs until he had a nice fire going. Then he put chunks of meat on spits to roast over the fire, and opened a can of beans that he heated over the fire. I took the horses to water, now they need hobbled, Finn called. Cash hurriedly taught Finn how to hobble the horses, and then they hurried back to the fire before their meal burned. The following morning, Finn and Cash decided not to travel. Finn's injuries sustained when he flew over his horse's head hurt him badly, so he wanted to give it a day or two to heal. Everything, including his neck, had stiffened up. They spent the day with Cash teaching him everything he could think of about wood lore. He specifically taught him how to load his rifle and horse pistol, how to always keep the weapons clean, and how to fire them and hit a target, and how to handle them safely. Maybe in the morning, if you feel to it, we'll do a little target practice, Cash said. After a day's rest, Finn was still sore, but he decided he would tough it out and continue their ride toward Montana. Shortly after they rode onto the trail, Cash noticed dust on their back trail. Look behind us, Finn. Somebody's trailing us. You don't suppose Captain Walsh sent somebody after us, do you? I wouldn't put it past him. Let's stay alert, be prepared. We might end up in a shooting war before you've ever even fired a weapon. You remember what I told you about loading and firing your weapons? Yes, I remember. If you have to shoot, put the man in your sights and squeeze the trigger gently. When the gun goes off, it should be a surprise. If you jerk on the trigger, it'll pull you off target. Take note of this. If your enemy is close, just point the horse pistol and squeeze the trigger. If you take the time to aim, you'll probably get shot. Just point the pistol the way you would point your finger at an object. I'm scared, Cash, Finn said, honestly. I am too. It's all right to be scared. But in the end, we rise to the occasion, Finn. Shoot to kill. Don't mess around and take a chance on getting yourself shot. Who do you think's back there? If it's actually somebody Captain Walsh sent to kill us, I'm betting one of them is Rory. As you know, Rory hates us. There are two of them, though. Hard to say who they might be. If they attack us, how do you think they'll do it? They get in close, or they try to shoot us with rifles at a distance? It's hard to say, Finn. Got one thing going for us, though. There isn't any place in this wide, open, expanse of country for them to ambush us. That gives us the advantage of seeing them coming, so we can get prepared. Look, Cash. One of them left the trail and headed off east. Why do you suppose he would do that? I think he's going to lope his pony and get around in front of us. By doing that, they intend on putting us in a crossfire. Let's fool these bastards. Let's head off to the west and their maneuver won't work. Great idea. They left the trail and headed west at a canter. Hurrying along like this ain't doing my sore end and neck much good. I'm sore too. It's just something we'll have to endure. Let's look for a place to make a stand. A buffalo wallow will be good, but very few buffalo have drifted into California. They're mostly out on the Great Plains. Once they started west, they spooked a herd of antelope, and they took off running at an unbelievable speed. What are those animals? Finn asked. They are antelope. I've heard it said that there's only one other animal on earth that can outrun them. The African cheetah. Look at them go. They are magnificent, aren't they? Yes. Are they get eaten? Finn asked. Yes, not bad. I prefer buffalo meat, though. Now let's forget about them and find a place to make a stand and we're both in end up buzzard meat. Before long, they found an old, dried-up stream bed, so they placed their horses around a bend to keep them out of harm's way, then they hunkered down and waited. By traveling west, they kept Rory and his companion, a fellow named Braden McCarthy, from coming at them from two different directions. It took the two would-be assassins quite a while to figure out they had been fooled, and come at Cash and Finn together and straight on. Here they come, Cash whispered as he and Finn peered over the rim of the stream bed. Rory and Braden were 200 yards out. Both Rory and Braden fired their rifles to try and hit Cash and Finn in the head. Both shots missed, but not by much. 
dirt and pebbles peppered Finn's eyes. He gasped in pain and wiped at his eyes. Stay low and go over to your horse. Fetch your canteen. Bring it back here and I'll have you lay on your back so I can wash out your eyes. Stay calm, though. No use panicking. We've got a dandy position to hold them off. We've got cover, and they are out in the open. If they are smart, they'll give this up and go back to the Tam of Shanter. Cash was able to clear Finn's eyes, so they commenced with the gunfight. Rory and Braden laid down low in the grass and fired from the prone position, and that made it more difficult to hit them. When Finn fired the Hawken 50 caliber, it kicked back harder than he had imagined, and it really hurt his sprained neck. But he ignored it and kept firing. You're doing really well, Cash said. Your shots are close. Eventually you're going to hit one of them. The gun battle raged on for an hour, but finally Cash hit Braden in the head, and that ended it for the fella. The 50 caliber round went in his left eye and blew out the back of his head in a gout of blood, brains, and bone. It was a horrific sight for Rory to witness, so he went a little crazy. He screamed and rushed toward the stream bed with a bloodlust. Finn and Cash had just fired their Hawken rifles, so they aimed at Rory with their horse pistols and tried to stop him. Both missed, and Rory was in among them before they knew it, and he had gone berserk. He stabbed Cash in the shoulder with his Green River knife, and Cash went down screaming in pain. Then he turned to Finn. Finn had never been in a knife fight before, but Cash had given him a short lesson on how to handle a knife in a fight. That's all he had going for him. But at the last second, he finished loading his horse pistol. If he could get it to work, he wouldn't have to fight with a knife after all. Then Rory turned back to Cash and was fixing to plunge the knife into him a second time. Hey, Rory! Finn screamed. I wouldn't do that if I were you! He said and pointed the pistol at Rory. Rory turned his attention on the Finn. He screamed and rushed at him with the knife with murderous intent. Finn squeezed the trigger and shot Rory in the chest. Rory fell and gasped in pain. You little bastard, you killed me! He managed to say. Yep, Finn said. Rory, where'd you get the horses? Finn asked. We rented them from a rancho. Fella named Juan Hernandez, um. How much did Captain Walsh pay you to hunt us down and kill us? Finn didn't get an answer. Walsh gasped and died. Chapter 6 Hailstorm Cash moaned. Partner, you just saved my life. Now do you think you can patch me up? Rory run a knife clear through my upper shoulder. Pain is fierce. I'm lucky the blade never hit a bone. I'll do my best. Tell me what to do and I'll follow your instructions, Finn said. First we have to stop the bleeding. I'm bleeding like a stuck pig. Fetch a clean shirt, put pressure on the wounds, front and rear. Just press on the wounds until they begin to clot. Finn did what he was told and he applied pressure for nearly half an hour. The wounds eventually stopped bleeding. Now make a fire, heat water. We'll need to clean the wounds nicely, Cash said. It took Finn quite a while to get a fire going. He had never started a fire with a flint and a striker, and Cash had to give him instructions. But eventually, he got it started and heated water and cleaned Cash's wounds. There was no telling what contaminants were on Rory's knife. Now fetch that bottle of water, bring it over, and wash off Rory's knife. All right, what's next? Finn asked. Heat up the tip of Rory's knife until it's glowing red. Finn did what he was told. Now what? He asked. Put the tip of the blade on both the entry and exit wounds. It will cauterize them, Cash said. You crazy, Cash? I'm not sure I can do that to you. You must. It will stop the bleeding and reduce the chances of infection. All right, it's your shoulder. What should I do with this whiskey? Dump a little whiskey <clears throat> on both ends and give me a slug of it. Finn did that, and then he took hold of the handle on the knife. Are you ready for this? 
he asked. I'm as ready as I will ever be. Go for it. If I pass out, gather up Rory and his companion's horses, confiscate all their supplies, then tie the reins to the saddle horn, and send them back toward Juan Hernandez's rancho. Finn touched the red-hot tip of the knife to the entry wound, and Cash gasped and sucked air between his teeth. His flesh sizzled and gave off an odor of burning flesh. All right. Now I'll do the exit wound. Are you ready for it, Cash? Yes, damn you. Go for it. Damn me. You're the one that suggested this. I know, I know. Just... I'm just letting off a little steam because it hurt like nothing I've ever experienced. Don't mind me. Just go ahead and do the exit wound before the knife tip cools down. Finn put the fiery knife tip to the exit wound, and Cash once again gasped in pain. Both knife slashes were nicely cauterized. They turned black, but they were sealed shut. There would be no more bleeding, and there was little chance of infection. All right, Finn. While I lay here and recover, go send those horses back to Hernandez's rancho. But make sure you take everything of value out of the saddle bags and take the rifles if they have any. We might as well inherit everything. After a little while, Finn returns, toting food, rifles, tobacco, and a couple nice riatas. Good job. Now go through both men's pockets. If they have money, we will collect on it as well. Cash, I found a total of 169 in their pockets. Good. Tuck that away. We can use it later when the need arises. Seems like Captain Walsh would have paid them more to kill us. He must have thought Rory and Braden would have it easy getting rid of us. Cash, I think I will take advantage of that fire and cook grub and boil coffee. You hungry? Yeah, I could eat. After dinner, hook onto those two bodies and use your horse to drag them off two or three hundred yards. We don't want the carrion eaters coming into our camp for their supper. Besides that, it might start getting ripe. Finn nodded his head in agreement. You don't think we should bury them? Hell no. <clears throat> they don't deserve a burial. You want to camp here for a while? Finn asked. No. I've changed my mind. Let's ride. Are you sure? Doesn't your shoulder hurt? Yes, it hurts. But I'm sure I can ride. They rode for the rest of the day and rode into a country thick with trees. They saw mesquite, rosewood, ghost gum, and canby's oak. But they didn't know the name of some of the other trees. The sky darkened, the temperature dropped, and it started to sprinkle. Better find shelter, Cash said. Before long, the air was torn apart by gigantic thunderclaps, and the sky was fractured by streaks of lightning that zipped around helter-skelter. Then it got worse. It started to hail. What should we do? Finn yelled over the sound of pounding hail. It's not a good idea to be under a tree during a lightning storm, but we haven't got a choice. If we don't, the hail is going to beat us to death. Let's duck under that oak tree over yonder. They rode under a huge oak tree, and Finn tied the horses around a nearby oak. Then he rushed back and covered Cash, under a tarp to ride out the storm. The hail was the size of walnuts, and it gave both men a terrible beating before they were able to slide under the tarp. I feel sorry for those horses, Finn said. They should be all right. They have thicker hide than we do, Cash said as he pulled the tarp securely over them. How does your arm feel? Finn asked. It hurts like hellfire. How's your neck? It's almost better. How long do you think this hailstorm's going to last? Hard to say. The hail beat down on the tarp with a fury, and the sound was deafening. They lay shivering for nearly an hour before the hail let up. When it was all over, the ground was littered with hailstones that were three inches deep. I'll be back in a little while. I'm going to unsaddle our riding horses and take packs off our pack animal, and then I'll take them over to that little creek and water them. After Finn took care of the chores, he kicked hail around in the meadow until he was able to uncover grass for them. Then he hobbled them and went back to take care of Cash. I'm going to see if I can find any dry tinder and get a fire going. I think we deserve a hot meal, don't you? 
Yes. My belly thinks my throat's been cut. While Finn was gathering tinder underneath the nearby trees, the unexpected happened. It started raining. Pouring would be a more accurate description. It drove Finn and Cash back under the tarp again. And this go-around, they were colder than ever, because they were now wet. They lay shaking like they had the palsy, and their teeth chattered. Cash, to pass some time, I'm going to tell you something about myself that you might find hard to believe. You already know some of it, so I will go into more detail. I never told you before because you might have thought I was rich and spoiled and a brat. What in the hell are you yammering about, Finn? Well, as you already know, my father owned a cotton cloth manufacturing company in Dublin, and he died or was killed. I inherited the company, and my evil Uncle Ronan was left out of the will and was very angry. I'm sure he's the one that had me shanghaied. And I think he killed my father. Before I was Shanghai, I turned a 49% share of the company over to a trusted friend named Lorcan Murphy. What are you trying to tell me, Finn? Cash asked. I'm trying to tell you I'm worth an incredible amount of money. An incredible amount, Cash. Finn, don't worry. It doesn't change anything. And you are still my trusted partner. And I certainly don't find you to be a snob. Cass, do you think there's any way to send Lorcan a letter? I'd like to find out what happened to him. I hope Ronan didn't do away with him to gain control of the company. I hope Uncle Ronan is dead. Further, I'd like to see if it would be possible for Lorcan, if he's still alive, to send me a bunch of that money. If there was some way to get a pile of money, I'd share it with you. Then we could send the letter out with whoever is sponsoring the rendezvous this summer. Possibly the letter could go to St. Louis, down the Mississippi to New Orleans, then around to New York, then across the Atlantic to Ireland. The odds are stacked against you, but it wouldn't hurt to try. Cash and Finn lay shivering for two hours more while it rained. Finn, we're all right here, but let me warn you to never camp in a gully during a rainstorm. Why? Because you might become the victim of a flash flood. A wall of water might slam into you and wash you along and drown you. Does that make sense? While we're pinned down here shivering, why don't you teach me a few more things a mountain man should know? Cash nodded his head. Sure thing. It will help pass the time while we wait for this rain to let up. When the rain let up, Finn went to work getting a fire started. After considerable trial and error, he finally managed to get it done. So he and Cash changed into clean, dry clothes and hung their wet clothing off tree branches to dry. A marvelous double rainbow arched across the sky and it was anchored at four points to the ground from off in the distance. The earth had been cleansed, and it smelled fresh and pure. Finn had never seen such sights. He gazed out across a vast stretch of uncharted country that didn't have any other person in sight, or any of humanity's trappings to spoil the view. It's a good thing I put our extra tarp over our spare clothing and bedrolls, Finn said. Ain't that the truth? Cash, how do you feel? I ain't gonna lie, I feel like hammered shit. Finn laughed. That doesn't make sense, Cash. Well, let's put your bedroll on the tarp and why don't you get in it. You need lots of rest until you get feeling better. Finn, I'm sorry, but I think that's the best for me. I'm frozen stiff and this shoulder is giving me grief. Would you bring me that bottle of whiskey? Maybe a couple snorts will help me fall to sleep. Finn nodded his head in agreement. Yes, I'm sure you are right. I'm going to check on the horses and then I'm going to place some of our camping gear close to fire and dry it. Then I'm going to cook supper. If you are asleep, do you want me to wake you? Yes. I'm so hungry right now I could eat the south end of a northbound mule. Cash, that's so vulgar. Sorry, I'm not what you call refined. I'm just an old country boy. Finn kept the fire going into the night and successfully dried out all of their gear, and then they spent a relatively comfortable night sleeping by the fire. The next morning, Cash woke up with a runny nose, and he started coughing and wheezing. What's wrong, Cash? You don't sound all that good. Finn, I'm sorry. I'm in terrible shape this morning. My shoulder is giving me grief, and I got the sniffles, and I'm having trouble breathing. Being wet and freezing for several hours yesterday has brought this on. 
I'm surprised I'm not sick as well. It sounds like your lungs are congested. That happened to my father several times, and he called it pneumonia. Do you think you have pneumonia? Cash had a coughing and wheezing fit. I wouldn't be surprised. Then people die from pneumonia. You're not going to die. You can't die, Cash, because you promised to take me to Montana and to show me how to be a mountain man. Then I'm going to hang on to the life the best I can, but... But I don't think we'll be able to travel for a couple of days. I'm sorry, but you're going to have to do all the chores around here. I don't mind. Look at you, though. You're sweating. You must be burning up. He put his hand on Cash's forehead and felt heat. So he went down to the creek and soaked a rag in cold water, and he bathed Cash's face and neck. It seemed to work because Cash felt cooler to the touch. Can you eat something? he asked. No, I'm not hungry. I think the best thing I can do is go back to sleep. After saying that, he went back to sleep and began gently snoring. But his breath came in jagged gasps. Finn took the horses to water and then put them on fresh grass. They were still hobbled, so he didn't have to worry about them wandering off. He went back to their camp and fiddled around with their gear. He checked to see if everything was dried out nicely. Then he arranged it all neatly so that it would be easy to gather when they decided it was time to ride. After he finished the chores, he went and checked on Cash. Cash's fever was gone, but he was suffering with chills. He was shaking badly and his teeth were chattering. Hold on for a little while, and I'll work out a plan to warm you up, he said. He grabbed their spade and dug up three flat rocks and threw them in the fire. Then he got a hold of the tarp and sleeping robe and pulled Cash a little closer to the fire. Next, he dug three shallow holes in tandem for the flat rocks, so they would be even with the ground. It was an easy matter to shovel the rocks out of the fire and fill the holes with them. It worked out nicely because the rocks came out level with the ground, and they wouldn't poke Cash. Finally, he slid Cash back over the rocks, and the heat from the rocks warmed Cash up nicely. Great idea, Finn. Those rocks are warming up my old hide. They were at that camp for three days. Finn ministered to Cash's every need during that time. First, Cash would be freezing, so Finn would heat the rocks for him. Then, Cash would run a temperature, so Finn would bathe him with cold water. Finn fed him a beef broth for two days, but on the third day, Cash was able to take in solid food. It was touch and go, but Cash pulled through. Cash, if you had died, I would have just killed you. Cash laughed. Now that makes a lot of sense. They both had a laugh over that. Thank you for listening to this episode of Stagecoach, brought to you by Dusty Saddle Publishing, the home of Western excellence, where the best of the Western authors can be found. Visit our website at dspublishingnetwork.com. Please join us for our next episode as we continue with the adventures of Finn Sullivan, Mountain Man, by Scotty V. Casper. Please hit the subscribe button so you'll never miss an episode of The Stagecoach.